Hey guys, this is Roll Advantage, DM Dakota here. I'm going to go through a module, a uh, one-off, that I had custom made uh, for players right around the level of 14, and it's called Mindartis the Mad's Mausoleum of Mirages. In this module, um, it is about a mad wizard who is called Mindartis, and um, it's set in the Forgotten Realms. And there's rumors that, say, Mindartis the Mad has this legendary artifact. It's a book called the Cere Cerebra Nomicon. This book has the ability to give immense knowledge to the reader along with spell-like abilities that come from the mind known as psionics. Along with this book, if a Mind Flayer, also known as an Illithid, comes in contact with this book, they can actually turn into an Elder Brain. And you'll see a little bit of that later on in the tower. But basically... Right around Golden Fields, which is this fortified farming settlement, um, these uh, these storms came overnight, and it just keeps on raining and flooding out the crops over at Golden Fields. So it's this really big problem, and uh, it seems that this tower appeared overnight. And um, you'll find out that uh, Mindartis is actually an illus illusionist, uh, and his tower was built from a... Um, his uh, ability as an illusionist to create something and make it real. Um, the weather happens to be from a Mirage Arcane spell, which lasts quite a bit of time, and he's going to be here for, um, I don't know, a bit of, about a week or so. Um, so, uh, as far as mimicking this um, this person, just say crazy weird things. As it is a tower, uh, his voice is going to echo while he's researching. And this this tower is about eight um, stories tall. Uh, I did include a chart down below, um, so that way you can just randomly shout these things while the players are um, going through this tower. Um, so don't be uh, don't be afraid to build suspense on this as uh, there are quite a few monsters that have inhabited the lower floors of his tower as he doesn't go down there. So you'll see cloakers, mimics, animated tables, that sort of thing. So we're going to um, go down below. Um, so you'll want to look over the traps. And some of these traps, as there's quite a bit, uh, they can be illusions or they could be real. And it's always up to you, uh, as the DM, when you're running this, that you can always make everything real, or you can run it as fake. The way I do it is I roll a 1d20 uh, to figure out which trap is real, and if it's if it's a 15 or higher, it's action illusion. And so there's no harm going to come from the illusion, but it's going to make your players really, really guess what's going on the entire time. If they are affected by a trap that is an illusion, give them a... Um, a saving throw to see if they do get madness. Uh, I usually do that through um, wisdom saves. And there will be details on what the uh, the saving roll is for the DC against that madness. Um, let's see. I do have a map included. Uh, this is going to be a tile-based system where every single square here is 5 feet. Um, there is also a key. Uh, so green um, tiles are actually the floor entrance, the blue ones are the staircase going up, and the gray ones are objects. And those objects will relate to different parts. So the first floor, um, and with all following floors, anything in yellow right here um, is words, it's flavor text. And so you'll want to read that out loud. So um, they have different areas that they can go to, and some of this stuff is very fun for me. Um, I had to really plan out this over the course of maybe two days to figure out what would actually be fair and um, try to uh, include some ways to get around some certain challenges. So it's not just like a hack and slash or anything like that. This actually takes some time to go through, and because the traps can be illusions, there's a lot of replay value in this. So you'll want to... Um, Read the flavor text out loud, and then in bold, there's going to be special things that deal with the actual area. So, um, in the beginning, uh, the walls look brand new, with fresh-looking mortar put down for bricks that look hand-carved to perfection. 
A few drawings line the walls inlaid with gold to depict some sort of blocky, large blocky humanoid, many feet tall to a normal sized person in robes, building something. Down the hall is a turn about 10 feet to the left, and a door sits at the end of the hallway straight ahead. So these um, identifiers right here actually tell, according to the map, what is there. So in the lounge, uh, it's just a normal place, um, just a, a normal lounge, and um, there's going to be an end table beside some chairs, some piles of notes that you can um, include for whatever fits for your campaign, such as Blightwood Thorns and Unicorn Blood, just things I made up. Um, there's going to be books, and, and um, what's very, very important here is that there's going to be some monster heads that are mounted to the mantle. And the important one here is some that looks so strange that it doesn't look like anything has been witnessed before. So that creature is a multi-eyed demon, and it, it glares at the players who inspect it. And instead of lips, it has tentacles that seem to slightly move when the players look through their um, periphery, uh, their visual periphery, and um, peripheral vision, my bad. And so if a player actually comes up and inspects it, there is going to be a wisdom saving throw for that of a DC 17. And if they fail, it's going to cause one level of madness. There's also a secret door in here um, behind the bookshelves. And um, you can um, flavor this however you want, but usually I go with like a, a slight breeze can be heard and felt from behind a bookshelf when they do a perception check. And this is where your rogue comes in. And I really like... Um, how rogues explain what they're doing. A good video to um, watch would be WebDM's rogue video where um, Pruitt and um, Jim Davis talk about the various techniques that rogues go through. So um, for here I would maybe give a bonus if they're using like flour to um, put against the bookshelf where they feel the breeze to see that there's actually wind coming from it or something like that. So um, that secret door is actually going to bypass uh, a large part. Oh, go down a little bit. Ah. So right here is where that uh, secret door would be right here. And it would be going to 1B. Instead, they could go around to 1E. And there's going to be a mimic in here with, um, I think it's fine wine in here, uh, worth 25 gold. But there's going to be a mimic up in here. Um, so, we'll carry on to 1B. Doo, 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 doo. So, that's a dining room, and these dining rooms are very, very important, um, especially for traversing this location. Um, just describe the chandelier, which is very, very important. If, if there's one thing you need to actually tell about this room, it's the chandelier. But uh, this, the dining rooms, there's going to be one on every floor except for, I believe, floor seven and eight and um, you'll see as the floors go on that the higher you go it's going to change slightly and get darker and darker for the floors so this table has various meats cheeses breads and drinks um, very very luxurious chandelier that's giving off magic uh, if they use a detect magic spell um, and it doubles, ugh, it doubles as a drift globe and a teleportation device and there's going to be keywords for the drift globe to turn on and off. And a drift globe, if you don't know what that does, is it, it turns on and off lights. It, it emits light if you use its passphrase, and then it can turn off light with that same one. And for the first floor here, the word search is going to be that passphrase, because you know players are going to say the word search, and once that light goes out, people are going to start freaking out. And it's just a little way to mess with them. If a player touches that chandelier, they get teleported to a different floor. And you can determine that by a 1d6. Uh, the die roll will teleport the character to that floor and a location that has a similar chandelier. If the die roll is on the same number that happens to be the floor number, such as being on floor 1 and your roll of 1, they're actually teleported to the 7th floor where there is going to be a trap there. Um, and this floor also... Uh, for this uh, dining room, you want to let them see that um, eating this food, no matter what, is not going to quench their hunger and the food does not quench their thirst um, because it's going to be an illusion. It's an illusion that you can manipulate and it's malleable, but it's going to kind of be a foreshadowing all the stuff that's going to be happening through here. 
Um, if you go down south from there, there's a barrel storage, and there's going to be a tapestry on the wall that is actually a cloaker in disguise and will attack the players. At this point, you want to live up the, um, the cloaker's ability to uh, turn into multiple creatures through an illusion. Uh, you'll want to um, wrap the cloaker around a player's head to actually start suffocating them. Do not let them feel like this area is secure and safe. Always be trying to live up an impression that there's danger around every corner, as you should through every dungeon. Uh, there's going to be a set of stairs that lead up to the second floor, right around there. And five, or 1E is the storage room. Uh, a bunch of crates and barrels uh, are untouched and unpacked for the most part. And it, they line the walls um, all the way up to the ceiling. And there's this little crevice area that they can barely squeeze through. On the top there is going to be a mimic. And it takes the form of a crate on top, about 10 feet high. And it will try to grab anyone with its tongue as they go through this area and start searching through crates. If they do search through the crates and um, are not attacked by the Mimic or the Mimic has been defeated, um, they can find three pounds of cooking spices, a set of ivory cooking utensils, and a bottle of fine wine. Just to throw in some flavor text, like this is a, a pantry of some sort. The second floor... Um, it splits off, and um, 2A is a collapsing roof trap. That's what's memorable about this, and it turns into a dead end. So you'll see um, a rug made of animal pelt near the back wall next to the door, a few benches lining the walls around, holding a few lit candles and various utens utensils for writing. The tile work on the center of the floor is intricate with an appealing design with shades of cream and red. As you look around, you see cracks in the bricks near the ceiling that look like it collapsed at any time, and that should give off a key of what's going on. Now here is where you would actually start rolling to see if this trap was an illusion. Uh, there is going to be a pressure plate that's actually next to the southern benches, um, and it's going to be uh, pretty hard to find. Um, I would say like a, a DC, probably 17 or so, uh, perception just to find it. And um, once a player steps on it, just trying to inspect the um, the benches, um, roll initiative for that. On count 10 for initiative, the um, the illusion or the, uh, the the walls fall and hit whatever player is going to be in there. Um, you can do like a, a dexterity saving roll or whatever you want. But note that there is a door on the opposite wall that they came in from. And that animal pelt rug is going to be um, actually a, sp a pitfall uh, trap with spikes. And so people are going to run to that other wall as soon as they see that the, the, the ceiling is collapsing on them and then get trapped into that spike pit when it, it's pretty much setting them up for failure. And it, it was pretty fun when I ran through this. Um, again, you can um, detect if that pitfall trap is here with the DC-15. Um, you can investigate it. Um, if they are running and try to um, go through that door, the dexterity saving through is at disadvantage because they're focused on the ceiling coming down. Um, there is another dining room here, and live up the uh, the deja vu factor here, um, that everything looks the same except um, the table is empty this time, and there's the same chandelier. This time, oh, I guess... I did not change the uh, the passphrase. Uh, it should be climb right here. So climb is the passphrase for this floor. Um, now here's one of my favorite traps in this entire tower. It's called the head that breathes fire. And basically, there's a few parts to this trap. There's going to be a fireplace in this room that is... Um, by the stairs, and above that fireplace is a black dragon's head. And if any player is worth their salt, they know black dragons actually breathe acid. So they're not going to be expecting it to breathe fire. There's going to be a few um, tables around with a crooked table, looking like it's been pushed in a hurry, like someone bumped into it trying to escape from here. Um, and that's going to be part of this whole... Um, trap set. <clears throat> There's also a tapestry that dangles on the western wall, and it shows a scene of a flowing river just for flavor text, but behind that is a secret door also. Um, 
let's see. Oh, there's also a tripwire. And that tripwire is going to be um, somewhere in the room, up to you guys. But um, if a player readjusts this crooked table that should show um, scrape marks on the floor because it's just off balance and it got scraped on the floor while it was moved, um, if they realign it, there should be a click that comes behind the tapestry and it lowers the secret doors difficulty from a 13 down to a 20 to, or my bad, a 30 down to a 20 for their thieves tools check. This will also arm the dragon head trap. And the, the dragon head trap is going to be a multi-part thing. So this would be the first part to it. Um, so behind the tapestry is that locked door. If they don't realign that table, then it's going to be a DC 30 to actually get in. The tripwire, if it is triggered, um, it's actually going to be what makes the dragon head not arm. So once the tripwire is broken, you should play up the fact that it's really tense and someone should be expecting a trap to a, a trigger right away. Um, which is very, very, very uh, uncommon uh, for this fact because it's actually what stops the trap. And so it's going to be tense and people are going to be paranoid and you want to live that up. Um, then there's also going to be a pressure plate right in front of the uh, the dragon's head. Um, so once this tra pressure plate has been stepped on, that's what releases either the illusion or the real trap from the dragon's head mouth. If it's going to be a real trap, it's going to be centering a fireball on that pressure plate. Or if the tripwire has been broken, that's going to release an illusion of black sludgy acid from its mouth that's going to be fake. Um, the dragon head down here it explains everything that needs to happen for it to actually set off the fireball. So the three requirements that must be completed all together is to um, make sure that the crooked table is realigned. Um, the tripwire must, must be still intact and also the pressure plate must be stepped on. If all of these things happen, then the fireball gets centered on the pressure plate. Um, if not all of these things have occurred, then an illusion of black sludgy acid spews onto the pressure plate. It's very obvious that it's fake afterward. So, right after the players unlock the tapestry door, um, it's going to be an invisible statue in the center, but the entire room is just empty after that. Uh, there's nothing else of value, but there is going to be a 20 by 20 foot um, room with nothing in it except for an invisible statue that looks like an octopus if someone can see invisible objects, um, like with true sight or what have you. It looks like an upside down octopus with tentacle, uh, its tentacles flailing upwards. Um, in the head of the octopus is a sword sheathed into the stone, and it's um, gold plated with uh, a gemmed hilt. And the sword is also invisible unless it's been removed from the stone. Pulling the soul sword out requires a character of chaotic alignment or a DC 25 strength check. It is a plus two sword of chaotic alignment and sentient called persuasion. And it will try to convince its holder telepathically that the traps ahead are either illusions when they really aren't or that the tr real traps are illusions. But it won't try to do it all the time, just whenever it feels like. So at that point, just roll maybe a, a d20, and if it's above something, it tells the truth. If not, it'll lie to the person holding it. So that way, it's never um, what it seems like. After the dragon's head going south is the stairs. That will lead to the, th the third floor. Um, there's going to be uh, flames and um, stuff from the torches, but they seem pretty dim. Um, it's going to be very humid, like a, a blanket of humidity just hitting the players, and it's going to be dusty. Um, there's going to be a door to the east, and this area is going to be a hall of dart or a hail of darts. Um, it's going to be a hallway with a bunch of tiles that have painted runes on top of them, and this hallway spreads for about 15 feet wide and 25 feet long. Uh, there is a closed door in the northwest corner and a chest directly north in an alcove that has no runes on it. This is where you're going to see if your players work together really well or if, they, um, if they're all for themselves. So these tiles have nothing to do with anything in here. 
So you want to roll initiative, and after five rounds, after everyone's been set through the door, then darts are going to fly from the walls. Yeah, like I said, these tiles have nothing to do with um, the trap itself, so it's going to give some paranoia what's going on, and so your rogue is probably going to use their 10-foot pole, hit a rune, and see that it does nothing. And so he's going to tell others, like, hey, this rune set is safe, so let's travel just on these. The timer, though, at the end of five rounds, is a set of six poison darts, which four darts make up a single set, and they fly from the walls, and you can choose if they're a real trap or if they're an illusion. These things have plus eight to hit, and it takes um, 1d4 piercing damage per dart that hits them. And they must make a 15 DC constitution saving throw um, with poison that affects them. You'll want to um, play up the poison rules found in the DMG, which uh, I believe gives them disadvantage on saving throws, attack rolls, and ability checks, if I'm not mistaken. But if the, um, the locked chest at the end of the hallway in that alcove is tampered with, the timer stops and it triggers the poison darts. Even if there's four rounds left, this is going to trigger all the darts, which means everyone that remains in that area, except for the person in the alcove, is going to get hit by these poison darts. It's going to be a simple trap to uh, unlock 5DC, which means your rogue should be, even if they roll a 1, they should be able to get it um, with a proficiency bonus of plus two and a dexterity bonus of plus two and they should have hopefully expertise in thieves tools um so right off the bat like they should already have a plus four from expertise so even rolling a one we'll get that five so it guarantee that this chest will unlock but it's set to um screw with the players and the party see what's going to um if it's going to affect the others for their uh choices and so i often have um, players that want to play rogues as lone wolves and um, do their own thing. So this will hopefully get those players on the right track to actually work as a team and not just go after the treasure itself. The plain old room um, is... Um, let's see... Oh, it, it's another chandelier room. And this passphrase is light. And so if they say oh, look, the chandelier is glowing light, then that should turn off the light right away. And then, you know, freak some people out. 3C is going to be a gelatinous cube because wizards have to dispose of their trash somehow. Um, and it's going to be a pit with a gelatinous cube. That's it. And you'll see from up above what actually occurs on the fourth floor to have players fall into this gelatinous cube. Um... There should be a skeleton that lays in the middle of this goop, blah, 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 roll initiative for whatever player is actually in there, and it actually damages their armor, um, according, which I took from the, um, the black pudding rules. So if the armor it takes damage, um, it gets a minus one penalty to it, so their armor class should be going down from that, and then once their armor has a total penalty of negative five, then the armor disintegrates, and they, they say bye to that plate mail. I mean... That sucks for them. Um, but inside the gelatinous cube is an ivory brooch with elaborate golden inlays uh, worth 750 gold. Um, and it is unaffected by the dissolving acid because it is a magical item. You can give it whatever magical properties you want, even if it's the minor ones, but it, it it's there. Once the players reach the fourth floor, um, it should be getting pretty dark and... Um, unkept at this point compared to the first floor where it's heavily thick with dust and there's cobwebs and it hasn't been taken care of in some time. Um, over in 4A there's going to be a hallway and it's lined with eight gargoyles, four on each side, um, and they're all crouched down with sly grins on their faces except for one. And there should be um, a gleam of something shining on their head which happens to be an alexandrite gem per head. And they're worth 500 gold each. And so these gargoyles, gargoyles um, they're inactive unless the gem is taken from their head. Or um, if the, uh, the one that is not grinning 
emits the gas equal to a ninth level sleep spell, which is a save DC of 17. Um, it is triggered by a pressure plate directly in front of the statue, and it can be seen with a perception check, DC 15, um, and there is a Thieves Tools check to disable it. Um, if the check is failed, though, it will trigger the pressure plate and spread that gas into a 20-foot radius centered on the statue. Anyone that fails their save DC will actually fall asleep, and the gargoyle will pick them up and proceed to 4B. And from here, um, it's going to be the, um, the effects of a minor illusion or a programmed, programmed illusion spell, something like that, um, where it should sound like there's people being attacked or there's children crying, um, whipping lashes ringing out through this hallway. And halfway through the hallway is going to be a, um, a pivot point in the floor. And so it's going to be weighted. So if someone stands on it, it actually starts tilting down. And players will need to do acrobatics check from falling. And at the bottom where they fall into is that gelatinous cube with no way out. So they need to keep on doing these acrobatics check to uh, succeed and climb up. And if they fail, then they fall down. Um... After, 4C is going to be another chandelier room with the phrase, climb? I don't know. Make up your own phrases if you'd like. Uh, totally up to you, though. Um, fifth floor um, is going to be the monk room. And this monk is going to be made out of uh, stone or, or iron, whatever you'd like. Um... And around them are five bars of gleaming silver. So it's going to be silver ingots. And there's going to be a um, a, uh, a puzzle here. So this solid bronze statue of a monk sitting, um, you know, crisscross applesauce on the floor with her eyes closed. Her palms are open and turned upright. And the words are etched into the surface of the plaque in front of her that reads, If all wealth is chaos and order is an illusion... Don't give me your loss, I need your seclusion. Money and gems and precious things, those are all trivial and needless strings. Give what is endless and can't be gained, a precious resource that will wane. And so on the plaque is also a unique dagger sheathed into it, a, uh, a curved blade of obsidian. And the arms are weighted just like a merchant scale. And at this point you want to roll initiative. Um, the only way to actually beat this passphrase is if the players just sit and wait for an entire round without interacting with it. Because the answer to this is time. Time is endless, but you can't gain time back. And it is a precious resource that all people have to endure. So, um, behind that monk is another door with a DC 30 dexterity check to unlock even if it's successfully picked, the locking mechanism will shoot a single poison dart at whoever locked it, unlocked it, my bad. And it has the bestow curse effect placed on that dart um, as a poison. It causes the 5th level spell of bestow curse, lasting for 8 hours. And they have uh, disadvantage on all charisma saving throws and ability checks. And that is because... Um, to deal with Mind Artist, you have to use your Charisma, because he doesn't really want to fight. Um, to um, pass that Monk um, puzzle, once you successfully do that, it actually disarms the Bestow Curse Dart, so it no longer has that effect, and um, it will actually unlock the door itself. It doesn't even have to be picked. Um, if the players do not go through that door, they go through the normal southern door, um, because they somehow failed to open the door or didn't get the passphrase or whatever, or the, uh, the puzzle correct, uh, there is still a way around. Um, it deals with the room of poison gas, and as soon as they enter, um, the, all the doors lock. And there's um, two tables with a small, box, a small box, a few chairs, a couple of tapestries, and um, some human skeletons. And you need to roll initiative for this. Um, poison gas comes pouring through eventually. Um, and they can repeat the saving throw if they do get affected by the poison. Um, the rogue can pick the 
locked doors with a DC-16 Thieves Tools check. Um, one of the tables is actually an animated table, which is immune to the poisonous gas. And on the animated table itself is a Jade Bottle Stopper set worth 750 gold. After that is another dining room. Oh, and just a heads up, if the players actually go through the monk door that was unlocked, they bypass this room entirely with the poison gas. Um, the dining room up ahead uh, has the catchphrase of search, blah blah blah, does the same thing. After that is a boulder hallway, um, and the room has a downward slope um, that carries on for about 35 feet south. At the end of that is the stairway to the sixth floor. And um, after 10 feet, a magical tripwire has been activated. The tripwire should be invisible at this point. Um, and it can be detected with a sea invisibility spell or if um, one of the rogues like, threw flower uh, up into the air so that way the flower actually sticks to the, the tripwire makes it actually seen. Um, once it's been tripped, a boulder falls from the ceiling five feet behind some players. It has a speed of 30 feet per round. And if a creature is hit by the boulder, they take 4d8 bludgeoning damage. At the end of the hallway is a spiked pit. Um, it is a 5x5 five five foot area, directly in front of the stairs that lead up. Um, they can tell if it's an illusion or not with an intelligence investigation check. Um, if they are running from the boulder, they should have disadvantage on the dexterity saving throw for falling into it. Um, if the trap is real and they fall into it, then they take 2d10 piercing damage. Um, but the boulder should stop right before the, um, the trap. So it doesn't actually like come into the area with the trap, and if a player is stuck in there, they don't get crushed by it um, and not be able to escape. So it, it should stop, but it should block the path from heading back. The sixth floor is the last dining room, and <laughs> the players must be going crazy at this point. Um, they've been in this room hopefully about six times now, and everything in here is disgusting. So there's rotten food. Um, the roasted pig from before on the first floor has maggots in it, um, fruit that has wilted, uh, stale bread, all of that. And the catchphrase for this is leave, because they don't want to be anywhere here. They, they want to leave from this room. So if they say leave, turn off and on that light. Um, let's go to 6B, which is the mosaic of psionics. And this is actually what deals with the, uh, the backstory for this entire um, one-off. So it is a beautiful site that in this hallway has a rounded ceiling forming a tunnel that is smooth as glass. The walls themselves have drawings made of inlaid gold and silver showing a massive brain with tentacles coming from it. Slender tall beings that are painted purple praise this brain as their mouths feed on something. Tentacles that make up their lips are reaching it out to people's heads. As you look further on, these same purple beings are shoving some sort of tadpole into a human's ear with a look of terror in their eyes. It seems to go on as if some sort of transfer transformation is occurring, changing what was once a normal person into another purple creature. Symbols of strange shapes line the walls. And this is basically the transformation process of an illithid um, coming to be. So they'll take a neolithid, which is that tadpole, shove it directly into a humanoid's um, ear or nose, and that neolithid will actually eat and devour the entire brain in there and then plant itself into there, transforming a person into an illithid. That massive brain with tentacles coming from it from before is an elder brain, and that's what actually uh, communicates telepathically with all the illithids in that location, and that's what the illithids want that cere cerebronomicon for, is to turn into a, an elder brain itself. Um, so the runes on the walls is actually illithid writing, and they need an intelligence check, uh, arcana check, to reveal that it's actually an explanation for this entire process. Um, and if they don't actually succeed on that DC intelligence check, um, they should get one level of madness right away, and take 4d10 psychic damage for that. I actually had a player who's afraid of illithids uh, run into this, 
and he succeeded on his arcana check and just freaked out and he didn't want anything to do with this he wanted directly out of this so it's going to take um a little bit of this into the story so in a different hallway there's a bedroom and um it's a, a nice room that's where my dartist actually sleeps in um a four-post bed with a fine mattress with elegant silk um, a finely worked dresser made of mahogany with a tall four-foot um, golden mirror inlaid with gems. Um, blah, blah, blah. But this mirror is actually a mirror of life trapping. And any creature within 30 feet of it that sees the reflection must make a DC 15 charisma saving throw or be trapped along with anything it is wearing or carrying into the mirror. Now, if you remember, there is that bestow curse dart. And if they... Um, if they picked the, the door open and received getting hit by that dart, they have a disadvantage on that charisma saving throw. And hopefully that person will look in there and um, freak everyone out. Um, if a person within five feet of the mirror uh, calls out the specific name of a person trapped inside the mirror, they can communicate. A phrase will activate and deactivate the mirror, which is random from what Mind Artist actually shouts throughout randomly in this tower. And you can tell from the um, the table up above near the uh, beginning of this sheet, um, what he actually says, so it could very well be raisins. Um, <laughs> and uh, if that phrase is said, um, or the mirror is destroyed, anyone trapped in the mirror is released. The mirror has an 11 AC, 10 HP, and is vulnerable to bludgeoning and piercing damage, so it takes twice as much damage. Um, there is a room of torture. Should, um, get the players interested in what's actually happening. Um, basically it's various torture devices sitting on the ground and the rack stands out, which is one of those devices that tie ropes on the people's limbs and, like, twist to actually like, stretch their limbs out. Um, and there's a ghost that's actually seen on it sobbing while on the device and the cranking of gears is heard faintly uh the ghost is actually an illusion um named Aramil Daesh and his story is that um he was falsely accused of stealing when it was his own twin brother that stole an apple from the market and he was accused of stealing it and must bear the punishment for all eternity I mean it's crazy just just a dumb little apple but um, people are able to take his place instead, and if someone does, um, they take 1d4 um, constitution damage to their actual ability score per turn that they're on there. The damage is temporary, and it goes away once they're off of the device. And at any time, the characters can swap with one another, but if someone does not take the place of him, then the, the ghost Iramil, which is an illusion, goes back onto it, and he should be weeping and and very, very much in pain, crying out for release. Maybe it'll, you know, pull on the heartstrings of the players, um, but if a player, a single player, has been on the rack for three consecutive turns, which means that at most they can take up to 12 constitution ability damage, um, the gear stop turning, and the illusion dissipates. And a loud voice from a magic mouth spell then says that for your selflessness to assist those who are punished, your deed is not unnoticed, speak your heart's desire, and they are granted one wish for being so selfless. Um, right by that, um, because the people can actually skip ahead and just ignore the ghost and his crying and wailing, uh, there's a set of stairs that go up to the seventh floor then, and um, the... The area is very, very cold. Like the temperatures plummet, and it's because of a brown carpet that absorbs all heat. Um, and the brown carpet looks like just a, a fuzzy shag carpet. Um, it's actually a brown mold, and uh, that absorbs all heat. And if a player comes in contact with it, it'll wrap around them, trying to gather all heat from them, and uh, it will eventually do cold damage. And there's also a fireplace. In that fireplace. Um, is actually four fire opals worth 1,000 gold each. And these can only be recognized from normal charcoal once the fireplace is lit, where it will actually start to glow that that faint 
I guess, dim uh, orange and that the bright red fire look. Um, so the only way that they can tell that it's actual treasure is once the, the fire's been um, started in the fireplace. But once that happens, the brown mold will come out from its dormancy and head directly to the fireplace and it'll grow in size. And it takes its entire turn gathering the heat and extinguishing that fire. So it's going to be a threat to the players then. Um, the next hallway is called Run for Your Life. And it's just like the um, the other boulder room where there was a, a downward slope in the floor. Except in this one, the boulder is actually an illusion. And you should um, hint at it by saying that it's rolling slowly towards them silently. And they didn't hear it from behind them. Um, and there's also alcoves along this ha entire hallway. And each of the alcoves have um, needles lined into it. And it requires a DC 15 saving throw, dexterity based. Because these players, they're going to see this boulder chasing after them. And if they don't stop and think that, oh wait, this was silent. Um, they're going to go right for the alcoves and get damage from the needles. And let the boulder pass that happened to be fake in the first place. Um, now, if... A person touches the chandelier from the previous floors and they roll the same number as the floor that they were on, they get teleported to this area which is the crushing ceiling and you roll initiative and it's a 15 by 15 foot room um, and the ceiling lowers uh, on count 10 by 5 feet um, and when it reaches the ground whatever is left in the room takes 24 D10 bludgeoning damage, um, if it is real. There's also a crawl space that can be found with a successful 15 uh, perception check that leads directly to 7B, where that illusion boulder was. And um, if they try to hold up the ceiling from falling, they require a DC 20 strength check if the check, or if the illusion, my bad, if the ceiling is not an illusion. After three rounds, even if the ceiling hasn't reached the floor, it will raise back up to where it started. And lastly, the eighth floor. This area is an observatory. Um, all around it are large windows that reach the ceiling. And you'll find Mardardus is um, reading into a, a book hunched over on a table, calling out raisins. The old man shouts excitedly. Windows line the circumference of the walls, showing the storming clouds outside. A tuft of feathers are in place of a rope, in place from a rope, tying it directly to a watermelon that has gone bad. Bill, you won't believe this. There are entire villages that think magic is real. How bonkers in the head do you have to believe that? He exclaims as he looks away from a mounted spyglass to the ball of feathers. Eh? What do you mean someone's here, Bill? As he turns around to see the party. So, Bill is actually a parrot that he created himself and thinks is alive. So it's his familiar, uh, in air quotes, but it's, it doesn't, um, it's not real whatsoever. It's not sentient or anything like that, but he talks to it and somehow he can perceive that the players are there. Um, my nurse was actually studying over what he thinks was the artifact. And if the players use a detect magic spell on the book that he was looking at, it's just an ordinary book with a crudely drawn brain on the cover. Um, Mindardus actually communicates with Bill all the time. And um, Mindardus will refuse to give up the book. He is a level 16 spellcaster wizard and is not is not interested in fighting. Um, instead, he just wants some different things. So he will trade the book for a trinket made by a gnome or one of the trinkets from the player's handbook found on page 160. Teaching my artist how to play his musical instrument will also suffice, or giving a holy symbol of any deity will work. If all else fails, a tale of the character's adventures will do. If the characters try to fight, he will plane shift himself away, himself and the tower away, leaving the players to fall 80 feet. Now, for falling, um, that is actually 1d6 per 10 feet falling, so it will take 8d6 six damage for falling which is the equivalent to a fireball spell so if they get hostile he will just teleport away if he is unable to escape he will fight though and due to the mirage arcane he had casted yesterday 
the, uh, there's still nine days remaining on its duration, which is what actually causes the storms around him uh, and his tower. And he can use a legendary action or a normal action to shape the weather from outside to actually appear on the inside. And he'll try to make difficult terrain, such as icy ground or a thick fog. Another tactic he will try to do is cast Seeming on any foes, trying to change their appearance to look and sound like him, and then turn invisible. So he's all about illusions, trying to create what is fake into real, and try to mess with the players. But there's a bunch of uh, treasure down for um, completing this. Um, and it's all in a chest right by his bed. Um, you can actually roll this up as a treasure hoard with a challenge of seven or 16, my bad, on page 136 in the Dungeon Master's Guide. If you don't want to roll, I've already got some stuff that's already pre-made, so 14,000 gold. 1,750 platinum, 3d6 gems worth 1,000 gold each, a sword of answering, a candle of invocation, an animated shield, and a tome of clear thought, along with some spell scrolls. And I thought it would be ironic that the tome of clear thought would be in the possession of a crazy mad wizard um, that talks to himself in some watermelon with a, a tuft of feathers to it, um, and also like an animated shield because, I mean, all the things downstairs with the monsters were coming alive, so why wouldn't an animated shield um, be around? Um, on the table that has the mounted spyglass uh, is a set of plus one navigator's tools he uses to measure the stars shifting at night. And um, he'll have various things that are not legendary or um, a set of adamantian armor, such. Um, if the players do kill my Dardis, and he wasn't able to teleport away, the tower itself will slowly fall apart. And this would be one of those awesome action scenes where like, the building is falling apart and crumbling. And um, if you've ever played Ocarina of Time uh, for the Nintendo 64, think of Ganon's tower when you defeat Ganondorf and you have to escape the tower. Um, give the players five minutes to try and escape from here. Um, if they are still in the tower, then they take... Um, 1d6 bludgeoning damage for every 10 feet they are off the ground because it will eventually vanish. And there's a monster manual down below also. Um, tells about cloakers and gargoyles and stuff like that, some mimics. And then here's all the information for my Dardis. Uh, tells his hit points, his armor class, the spells that he has, um, the experience you get for him, his skills and saving throws. Um, and due to old age, um, the blinded and deafened um, conditions do not apply to him because he already has trouble hearing and trouble seeing. Um, he has some legendary actions, so uh, these are taken directly from the player's handbook for the illusionist uh, as their features. So I hope you all enjoyed this. There's going to be a link down in the description for um, locating this and give me some feedback. You uh, Tell me how you like it, how your players liked it. Um, what happened in the actual adventure, um, and I will talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye.